our minds, things that would stress us, that we would uh, think about. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we come to you right now in love and thanksgiving. Father, we just, um, uh, Lord, lay our hearts before you. Father, we, uh, uh, we know that everything that you do becomes good in our life. We know that you're looking out for everything that we uh, uh, have our hearts and our minds set on, Lord. You're concerned about the things that concern us from family members to the smallest minute detail. Father, there is nothing that concerns us that does not also concern you. So Father, right now we just are concerned about uh, coming into your presence, worshiping you, thanking you, Lord. Father, uh, letting our faith let the other things go. And uh, Father, because we trust you with them. Father, right now in this place there is just you and us. Father, in this place right now, we want to worship you with our whole heart, with our whole being. And Father, I pray right now that you would uh, come into this place, that you would uh, give us a conscious awareness of your presence. And Lord, I pray that the worship would be real to you, Father, that you would receive it, that it would be joyful to you. And uh, Father, we just love you and thank you and praise you today for all the blessings you've given to us, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm.
we need to have our hearts ready and waiting for Him. And keep a thirst for all things that are His. All who are thirsty. Thank you. 
praise you. We love you today. We glorify you. Lord, to have your way in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Do what? I know we're running. Well, I didn't have a whole lot of a whole lot of uh, speaking to do today because this is the first day of a new sermon series that I'm going to do called Jesus and His Words. And originally, I just had one sermon in mind that I was going to do, and I was going to do it today. And I had a dream the other day that I was talking with someone about Jesus and his words. And I woke up from that dream, and it's like, I felt like the Holy Spirit saying, no, this needs to be something that's going to be a couple of sermons. And so I said, all right, that's going to be a sermon series then. Um, so we'll be gone next week. Sheila and I will be out of town. But the following week, we'll have our first uh, topic in the sermon series. And that will be on prayer. But Jesus and His Words is the title of our sermon series. And we're going to introduce that today with just a couple of scriptures about Jesus' words. And so, let me open this up. Let me open the sermon up in prayer. And we'll read our first scripture. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we love you today. We praise you. We thank you for your blessings. We thank you for the leading of the Holy Spirit, Lord. And I felt led by the Holy Spirit to start this new sermon series. And I pray that through your the reading of your word and as we uh, delve into its pages, Father, I pray that you would uh, teach us what we need to hear. I pray that you would uh, guide us into all truth, help us to understand what we read. And I pray that it would be uh, revealed to us spiritually because it is uh, spiritual written and it needs to be spiritually discerned. So Father, help us to understand what the Spirit is saying to the church today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Oh, Mark 8 and five scriptures there, 34 to 38. Does anybody like to read this morning? All right, uh, Randy had his hand up first, so Randy, go ahead and read Mark 8, 34 and follow. This is from the, uh, the New Life version of Scripture. Jesus called the people and his followers to him. He said to them, if anyone wants to be my follower, he must give up himself and his own desires. He must take up his cross and follow me. If anyone wants to keep his own life safe, he will lose it. If anyone gives up his life because of me and because of the good news, he will save it. For what does a man have if he gets all the world and loses his own soul? What can a man give to buy back his soul? Whoever is ashamed of me and my words among the sinful people of this day, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in the shining greatness of his Father and his holy angels. There is a way that we like to do things. All of us have a mind and we tend to use it. Maybe sometimes a little, maybe sometimes not enough, but maybe sometimes too much. We figure out something that we want to do. We figure out the way we want to do it. And we don't want to hear what other ways there are because every man's way is right in his own eyes. I mean, we, when we give it, we get in our head something, it's hard for someone to convince us that we are in the wrong or that maybe there is a better way of accomplishing something. But that's just between uh, me and you and the fence post. You know, it's, I mean, we, we argue and sometimes squabble amongst ourselves. But we also have this little contest going with God because we decide we want to do certain things a certain way and sometimes God has it in mind a different way that we should go. His ways are so much higher than our ways. Really, there should be no contest at all. If we believe in God and we believe in His greatness and His glory, if God says, no, you need to do it this way, we ought to just fall in line. I mean, that ought to be, that ought to be just plain and simple. But we are stubborn human beings, and sometimes we'll even argue with God, right? I hope I'm not the only one that 
does that. To be a follower of Christ, we have got to get over this little attitude that we walk around with. This human nature that tells us that i got to be right all the time. We've got to be willing to say, um, I don't have the right plan. Uh, my plan maybe is doomed to failure. And if I want to succeed, if I want to, to accomplish what I want to see have happen, I've got to let God be my guide. I've got to let God have His way in my life. To be a follower of Christ, we must be willing to do things Jesus' way. Everybody say, Jesus' way. Jesus' way. Proverbs 14 and 12 says, There is a way which seems right to a person, but the end is the way of death. If we are stubborn and we keep doing things our way instead of Jesus' way, we're liable to find out that we are going down a path that is not good for us. If we start doing things our way, we realize that things that we want, that is our flesh, things that we desire, is first of all an outcome that's usually not good for us. A uh, silly little example, you go to the buffet and I want to eat this certain Thing, and I want this certain thing, and I want this certain thing, and we want it all, right? And in the end, that way is usually not good for us, because then you get to have a big belly like me. But think about other areas of our life. Sometimes we're not happy with our marriage, and we start thinking about, boy, you know, think of all the people I could have married. <laughs> Nobody would laugh at that, <laughs> would they, <laughs> Ooh, think about all that. <laughs> Lord. <laughs> or we start thinking about things that, you know, I bought this, but if I hadn't bought this, I could have bought this over here. Not too far different of an example, I guess. <laughs> Whatever. Whatever we do in our lives, sometimes we second guess ourselves, you know, I could have done better. But you know, when you go back and you analyze those choices, I think we can come to realize that we don't really know what we're doing. We're just following our passions. We're just following our, you know, something that will make me happy in the moment. And God has not got just the next moment in mind. He's got the next month. He's got the next year. He's got down the road. He knows, you know, what we need later in life. We need somebody that's going to stand by us, somebody that's going to be faithful, somebody that's going to be trustworthy. And if you, you know, are looking for your next kick by just what is going to turn you on today, those kind of things don't tend to have lasting, intrinsic values to them. You know, a young person, they're out picking themselves a, a uh, a mate, you know, maybe they're going to look for somebody that's buff or whatever, somebody that looks good in a beach wear or whatever. Those are kind of shallow pursuits, but oh man, people are all over that. But what kind of person is that going to be in the long run? Are they going to be there for you through thick and thin? Are they going to stick by you and stand by you? Those are, those are kind of the differences in that. We, we have a way that seems right, but if you follow that out to its logical end, you realize that what I could have chosen, if I had chosen A or B or C, I would be in a lot worse place than where I am right now. And if we think that where we're right now is not a great place to be in, and you think, oh, I could have made these other choices, those other choices may have led you down even, you know, paths that would be uh, uh, less appealing than even what you know you think you're in now. If we let God make the big decisions for us and guide us along this journey, then we can trust that God is working out and watching out for us because the decisions that we make, if we let God help us make those decisions, He is making, helping us make those decisions for good. He is helping us have all things be good in our life. Romans 8.28, all things work together for good 
to them that love God and are called according to His purpose. If we let Jesus have His way in our life and we do things Jesus' way and let God be in control and love what comes from letting God be in control, in the long run, we are going to find a way that leads to life, not a way that leads to death. John 6, 63. I got two different translations down here in the bulletin. King James says, It is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. A lot of big words in there, so I was looking through other translations, and I like this one. I've never quoted from it before, a translation called The Voice. But it says, the spirit brings life, and the flesh has nothing to offer. The words I have been teaching you are spirit and life. When Jesus walked this earth in his earthly ministry, and he was teaching the disciples and everyone that, that came to hear his, his talks on the sermons on the mount and wherever he went, Jesus' words were filled with the Holy Spirit. The life of the Spirit was dripping from every word that He spoke. When we hear the words of Jesus, that Spirit is something that we can gloss over or we can, through the Holy Spirit, receive that deep meaning that He had. If we accept Jesus' way and His words and we make them our way, we follow in His footsteps and we listen to what He says and we do what He says, then that life in the Spirit will, will basically flow through our life. It will come through our life. If we are walking in Jesus' way, we will have the Spirit guiding us because the Spirit is all over Jesus' words. And the flesh has nothing to offer. You've seen that old uh, kind of analogy or that imagery where somebody's trying to make a decision and they got the little, you know, angel on one shoulder and the little guy on the pitchfork on the other and there's two different voices that you hear. You know, that literally doesn't happen, but in, in a sense that is what's happening in that these little voices are talking to us. It's the Holy Spirit saying, go Jesus' way. And then there's the devil who is trying to get us our own way. You know better than God. God's motives aren't pure, the devil would say. Even back in the Garden of Eden, he was talking to Eve. And he says, you know, God says this, but really, God just doesn't want you to know what he knows. Really, God just doesn't want you to understand and have this knowledge of good and evil. And he tried to present it at, to Eve in a tempting kind of a way to make basically say, don't go God's way, go your own way. Make your own decision. Be your own person. We don't know what is best for us. As human beings, we think we know what's best for us, but we really don't. We have a way that seems right to us, but the end is death. And Jesus' way is full of the Spirit. His way is the Spirit's way, and it is life if we follow it. <laughs> so to be a follower of Christ, we must be willing to do things Jesus' way. Everybody say Jesus' way. Now everybody else in the world that is an unbeliever, they are still operating under that Scripture and Proverbs, they have a way that seems right to them. And to them, it's just obvious. Oh, oh, the right thing to do is work hard all week and then party all weekend. Working for the weekend. Got to go enjoy life because life is short. And if we're not following their way of doing things, you know, we get our work done on Saturday at home and then Sunday is our day of rest and we come to church and we spend some time in the presence of the Lord, they look at us and they go, you're nuts. 
What are you doing wasting your Sunday? You could be out having fun. You could be out enjoying things. You could be doing all these fun things that your Bible says that you shouldn't do that. But let me tell you, they're good to do. You know, they're trying to, they're seeing the world through their eyes in a way that seems right to them. They don't understand that that way is leading to death. But have you ever had, you know, you've been, been in you know, the shoes that I've walked in where you're trying to do the right thing, and it's not just that little devil sitting on the shoulder that's talking to you, it's people around you. Do what? Yeah. yeah. It's not just that little guy on your shoulder. It is people look coming up to you and saying, why in the world are you wasting your time going to that place? Why in the world aren't you enjoying the things you could be enjoying? Your spouse isn't here. Live a little, you know. She'll never know or he'll never know. Live a little. You deserve it. You've worked hard all week. Words of life or words of death. Which words are you going to listen to? Jesus spoke words of life to us. And unbelievers, even though they sincerely believe that their way is right, they'll ridicule you for choosing Jesus' way. You've got to decide in your own mind which way you will go. And Jesus said, if anyone wants to be my follower, he must give up himself and his own desires. Because, not because Jesus wants to have us be blind followers. The Spirit is looking out for us. God wants the best for us. And if we insist on doing things our own way, then we can go to church, we can call ourselves a Christian, but if we're doing things the world's way or the way that seems right to us, then we're just going to be falling down all the time. We're going to be messing things up all the time. We're not going to have God's best in our life unless we do things Jesus' way. So that's why he says, if anyone wants to be my follower, he must give up himself and his own desires. And he must be willing to not be ashamed of me. When those other people start talking to us and they say, you're crazy going to church. That's a whole day you could be spending for yourself. And, and they'll try to shame you. Say, you're, you're crazy. You're stupid. Why are you doing that? We have to decide that we're going to follow Jesus' words and let our life be patterned after His words. And we have to make a decision up front that it doesn't matter what other people have to say. It doesn't matter if those decisions come with some element of shame because people don't, don't understand why we're doing that. That's the first step in the following Jesus' words is to give up on our own way of doing things and follow His way and not be ashamed by the unbelievers who think something different. Amen. We got another scripture here. It's John 14, 21 to 24. Miranda, were you were you up for reading? Go ahead and read that section. There's this from the New Revised Standard Version Scripture. They who have my commandments and keep them are those who love me. And those who love me will be loved by my Father. And I will love them and reveal myself to them. Judas, not the scared, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will reveal yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered him, Those who love me will keep my word, and my Father will love them. And we will come to them and make our home with them. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words. And the word that you hear is not mine, but is from the Father who sent me. So a moment ago we heard that Jesus said, if you're going to be my follower, you have to give up on your own ways. Now here, he kind of kicks it up a notch and takes it a step farther. How do you know if someone really loves Jesus? People that we know. There's a lot of people that you talk to and they'll say, oh yeah, I'm a Christian, I go to church. Uh, yeah, I pay my tithes. You know, or whatever they might say to convince you that they're right. Oh yeah, uh, my grandfather helped build that church. I go to church there. Whatever. I've been baptized. A lot of things that people will say. Oh, I'm a good person. 
But if you really want to know if someone really loves Jesus, look at kind of the choices that they're making for themselves. Are they following that path that seems right to them? Or are they following the path of Jesus? Jesus says, those who have my commandments and keep them are those who love me. If you see somebody and they're saying, oh yeah, I'm a brother, I'm a sister. But then they are not following Jesus' commandments. They have the commandments, they know what they are, but they're not following them. You know that the love is really not there in their own. They can talk a good talk and walk a good, but are they walking the walk? You know, that's... Mm -hmm. Those who have my commandments and keep them are those who love me, and those who love me will be loved by my Father. If we follow the commandments that Jesus is telling us, if we keep His words in our actions, in our thoughts, if we let it guide us through our life, God is going to pay attention. If we love Jesus and we follow what He tells us to do, and we are listening to His words, you're in the eyes of God, and He is watching you because He loves when you choose to follow Jesus' word. Verse 23, those who love me will keep my word and my Father will love them. And listen to this, and we will come to them and make our home with them. The Father is in heaven and Jesus is at the right hand of the Father. He is in heaven. And yet there's this long distance relationship we can have with them where it's not just like a phone call. It's not they're on the other end of the prayer line or whatever. There's a part of them that is living inside of each one of us. If we love Jesus. And by loving Jesus, we are keeping His words as part of our actions, as part of our thoughts. If we do that and we have the love of the Father, then that is when they will come and make their home with us. Now on the flip side, Jesus says, whoever does not love me and does not keep my word, whoever does not love me does not keep my words. So those that you want to you want to be able to know who loves Jesus and who doesn't, who is it that is keeping his word? Someone has the commandments and they don't keep the word. The kind of the conversation you might hear goes like this. Yeah, the Bible says X, Y, and Z, but God understands. Anybody ever heard that in the conversation? Oh, but God understands. You are a person with needs. Oh, God understands. <coughs> God He's not going to judge you if you do X, Y, and Z. If you go over here and, you know, have this fun, this little party over here or whatever. You know, you can skip church and go, you know, hang out with us or whatever. I mean, whatever the thing is. The pattern is almost always the same. Yeah, yeah, God says this. The Bible says this. But God understands. Everybody say God understands. That is the magic word. When you hear that, you know that somebody is about to run you off the rails. The love of Jesus is simply not there. They know the words. They have the commandments. They know what's right. But, the, but they're persuading you to not follow Jesus' word. That is a person who does not love Jesus truly in their hearts. If somebody truly loves Jesus in their hearts, they're going to say, you know, I know you're in a tough situation. It'd be easy to get off the rails, but I'm praying for you. Let's work on this together. Let me help you because you need to do what the Lord says. You need to do what Jesus' words are in this situation. That is somebody that loves Jesus. It may not be easy to hear when you're in the thick of it, 
But someone that loves Jesus is not going to lead you astray. They're not going to be the guy in the pitchfork over here in the horns and all that. They're going to be like that voice of the angel to you. Because that is somebody that truly loves Jesus. John 14 and 8 through 10, the NIV said, Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. And Jesus answered, Don't you know me, Philip? Even after I have been with you, among you such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, Show us the Father? Don't you believe that I'm in the Father? And the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me, doing His work. And that last passage that Miranda was reading there at the very last, Jesus said, the word that you hear is not mine, but it's from the Father who sent me. And here Jesus is repeating that, elaborating on that again. How can you, how can you ask me to show you the Father when you've heard me all along saying these words? The words that Jesus spoke were not really His own words. They were the Father's words. If we love Jesus and we are following His words, those words are coming through us. The Father's words were coming through Jesus. All of this love is emanating from the Father. Some people talk about the Old Testament God and the New Testament Jesus. And yes, if you look in the Old Testament, there were things happening there that people go, oh, I can't believe God did that. But even in the Old Testament, behind the things that had to be done, God's love was still there. God told him to go into the promised land, you know, and to wipe out the inhabitants, for example. And oh, how could a loving God do that? It was what had to be done for history to unfold and for God's kingdom to be ultimately established. And God's ways are higher than our ways, so we don't understand it. But God is love, and God's love finally got to have its full showing when Jesus was there. And when we do what Jesus said, God's love is still flowing through His people into this world. When Jesus speaks, the words that He, that he says are really God's words that are flowing through them. Jesus speaks the words of God. And when we listen to Jesus' words and we do what Jesus said, that is bringing us into relationship with the Father. We are getting closer to the Father because the words that we're following is really the Father's words to start with. Amen. Jesus spoke them and we are following them. So God loves us more. We are being drawn into relationship with Him. Jesus' words were not His own. They're God's words. And why is he speaking it? It's because God's got work it has got to be done. In the Old Testament, he had to get Israel to be an established nation. And that took some fighting. That took some violence. That took what you read about in the Old Testament. That was what had to be done. But God's love is flowing through Jesus and it flows into the whole world. God loved the whole world that he gave his son. History had to unfold a certain way. And now, God's love is flowing through Jesus and it flows through us to bring us all into relationship with Him. So the words are not Jesus' words alone, they're God's words. When, when the words flow through you, that is God flowing through you in your actions and what you say and what you are convincing other people to do. Finally, as we go through this sermon series about Jesus and His words, remember that everything that we read is a choice. Jesus offers us a choice. Matthew 7, 24 to 27. Who'd like to read that one? Go ahead. Therefore, everyone who hears what I say and obeys it will be like a wise person who built a house on a rock. 
rain poured, floods came, the winds blew it, and beat against the house, but it did not collapse because the foundation was on a rock. Everyone who hears what I say but does not obey it will be like a foolish person who built a house on sand. Rain poured, floods came, the winds blew and struck the house. It collapsed. As a result, it was a total disaster. So remember, the, there's a way that seems right to a person, but the end is death. And Jesus' words are spirit and they are life. We are hearing the words, and the words are presenting us with a choice. Ultimately, it goes back to, is that choice going to be a choice based on our own <laughs> thoughts and desires and visibility, that way that seems right to us that leads to death? Or are we going to follow Jesus' words and lead to that place that is fulfilling and is full of life? But there's a wisdom to it. If you want to reason it out, think of the wisdom of it. And here Jesus is comparing that to someone is building a house. If you're going to build a house, I'd say location, location, location is definitely an important little factor. If you live in Sevier County as I do, location, location, location is pretty important because if you go and you look at property for sale in Sevier County, they have a term there. Do what? Sinkholes. Sinkholes. Yeah, well, there's that, there's that problem too. I was, I was thinking about, you ever heard the term vertical acreage? Vertical acreage. So yeah, you read that ad in the paper and it says, you know, five beautiful acres of ground. And then you get there and there's this little postage stamp and behind it is a big hill that goes up. And you own that whole hill. There's a lot of land there. Or more likely, five beautiful acres of vertical and then on the top of the mountain is a little postage stamp where you put your house. That's more, more of the truth the way it normally is. Mine's the other way around. I live at the bottom of the hill. I can't pick up any TV signals or radio stations or nothing. So you're either in a hole or you're having to climb that hill and you better have your four-wheel drive because in the wintertime, you're not going to get up there. There's a wisdom in what God's word, God, Jesus' words are as God's love is flowing through us. If you're on a road that is Jesus' way, he compares that to someone who builds his house on rock. After location, 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 you better make sure you're on a firm footing, a good foundation. That's a little reference to a sinkhole. It was a couple of years ago we found out my little house was built on limestone. And limestone isn't really good in the long run because it tends to erode away. So, so we had a little sinkhole opened up in our property. That's how we found out about all this. Thankfully, it wasn't the house eating kind. It was just one of those little annoying things that was carried to death. Um, a little bubble of air in the earth that slowly moves up. But a firm foundation you got to build on. And it's wise to build on a firm foundation. If you understand that our own choices things that seem right to us lead to destruction and following Jesus' words will lead you to safety and security and a firm foundation, it's wise to build on that firm foundation. I mean, if you had a choice to build on rock or to build on sand, really it's wise to choose to build on rock. Just look at the, look at the facts of the situation there. Yeah, you build on sand, you got beachfront property for a little while, but only for a little while because then your little, your little house is floating in the water after that. You got a houseboat all of a sudden instead of a house to live on. You know, the view's nice, you get some sun, you know, you're, it's kind of like being on a vacation all the time, but if it's something that don't last, what good is it? If you make your own choices and they seem good for a little while, and the Bible even says sin is pleasurable for a season, but then one day you wake up and your foundation has fallen apart and your life is in destruction and ruin. What's, what's the wisdom of that? You enjoyed life for a little while, but now you're in a terrible situation. That's not wise. So following 
the words of Jesus versus following your own way, in the long run, you're going to be happier. In the long run, it's going to give you a, a, a better experience of life. You're not going to be struggling as much all the time. We all have struggles that we face, but we weather the storm. We're like the house that's built on the rock. When the storm has passed by, we're still standing. We're still hanging in there. And others have been swept away. It's wise to follow Jesus' words because it produces a good outcome. If you have an outcome that is a disaster, what, what kind of wisdom is that? Choosing not to follow Jesus' word is what leads to the disasters in life. It might be good for a while, but his words have value beyond what you can, what you can really calculate. I've heard people in, uh, you know, in past you know, testimony and they'd say, you know, I'm so grateful I'm not in the hospital today. You know, when you're driving down the road, you have no way of knowing if you're somebody that is not a good driver or a distracted driver or whatever is going to hit you and send you into, you know, a very perilous situation. It's, we think we're in control, but really, everybody else around us is there. But God is in control. Amen. If we are following Jesus' words and we're doing good in this life, God's got His hedge of protection around us. Besides the fact that, say, driving the speed limit is a wise thing to do. Keeping your hands on the wheel, not being distracted, following and being very observant of things around you. You know, if you are, if you're being careless with your life, that's not very wise. We're supposed to be watchful of the people that is with us and also to watch out for others. But destruction is just around the corner if we don't follow Jesus' words. John 12, 46 to 48 from the New King James says, I have come as a light into the world, and whoever believes in me should not abide in darkness. Another thing to compare the wise words of Jesus to, if we have this compulsion to follow Jesus' word and we make it part of our everyday living, it's like our, the light, the path of our life is lit up. We're not just wandering around in darkness. We have a guide that is taking us where we need to go. But this is all a voluntary thing. I mean, this is, this is for, you know, for, for human beings. Jesus didn't come down here and says, you will do what I say. It's not a forced thing. It's voluntary. He didn't say, you must be my disciples. He said, if you're going to be my disciples, you have to do things Jesus' way. But it's not forced upon us. Now look at verse 47. <coughs> if anyone hears my words and does not believe, I do not judge him. For I did not come into the world to judge the world, but to save the world. He who rejects me and does not receive my word has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. Jesus did not come to force God on anyone. Jesus did not come to make you be a good person and make you make good choices. Jesus came to offer us a choice and say, if you want to be my disciple, yes, you have to give up on your own way and follow Jesus' way, but it wasn't forced on us. But he says, if you choose my way, then it's going to be wise. You're going to have good outcomes. God will be in relationship with you and he will love you and our protection from God is all around us. But that is not forced upon anyone. And if anyone does not believe what Jesus has to say, and they decide, you know, this Jesus thing just isn't for me, God's not going to come down and slap you on the head and say, wrong, 
Basically, we get to live with the choice that we make. By not choosing Jesus, just understand that every time that you do something that is contrary to Jesus' words, that is the thing that's going to, is what you're going to be judged by in the end, essentially. If Jesus says, it's better if you do the things this way, and then you choose not to do that way, you're bringing that destruction upon yourself, but it's, it's the words of Jesus that's actually going to be repeated back to you in the end. I didn't actually have the scripture here, but in the book of Revelation it says that on the day of judgment the books were going to be opened and we're going to be judged by the things that are written in the books. What are the books that are in the book of Revelation? It's actually the books of the Bible, God's Word. The words of Jesus is how people, is what people are going to be judged by. On the day of judgment, you made choice X, Y, and Z. Well, why is judgment found against that person? It's because Jesus' words was to do A, B, and C. Something totally different. A way that leads to life. And you chose the way of death. It's not that Jesus is judging us. We're judged by our choices. We're judged by the actions that we have elected to do and we have opted to do. If you live by Jesus' words... We're going to, for example, watch out for other people. We're going to have love and concern for fellow man. We're going to be uh, careful not just of our property and goods, but of other people's property and goods and so on. Someone that's not following that will get themselves in trouble. And then why do they get in trouble? It's because of their choice. They didn't choose to do this wise and more perfect way. The way that is filled with the wisdom and the spirit that leads to life. Finally, Matthew 24 and 35 from the King James Version says, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words will not pass away. What Jesus has spoken is wisdom for the ages. It is eternal. It is vital to life. It is God's word spoken by the mouth of His Son. It is not something that is temporary. It's not a wisdom that is wise today and unwise tomorrow. It's not something that comes and goes and fades with the times. The love of God as spoken through Jesus lasts eternally. So as we go through this sermon series, Jesus and His Words, what we hear is going to be wisdom and goodness for all times. Something that if we haven't done it in the past, we can start today and begin doing it. Jesus and His words will have our first sermon on this topic. will be uh, two weeks from today. And uh, just uh, I'm looking forward to that. And I'm going to miss you guys next week. Uh, we'll be away for a much needed vacation. We'll be doing a lot of that. Uh, Susan. And uh, anyways, uh, let's see if anybody has sent some questions in today. We're still doing the text thing. You know, it's amazing yeah. this morning when you and I and I, we were out painting that flagpole. Yeah. And Emma said, you know, what we do is the choices that we make. <laughs> and it's amazing how that all lined up with it. I didn't have a clue about any of this. But I Amen. didn't have a glimpse on it either. <laughs> yeah. The Lord orchestrates things. It's amazing. It's that's that scripture verse that we read, um, John fourteen, the last of it. It is the Father living in me who is doing His work. God's got something to accomplish, mm -hmm. and He is going to accomplish it. And I want to be a part. We choose what we do because we love God and He loves us for following the words of Jesus. Uh, I mean, this, this very church, the reason it exists is because God had a work He wants to do. And, um, and I'm going to see it through as long as He gives me breath in my lungs to do it. So, anyways.
Anybody else got a comment or something to share? All right, well, uh, remember the prayer request this week. Keep up some prayer as we're traveling. We'll, we'll keep you in, in our thoughts and prayers. Um, for most of the time that we're gone, uh, we won't be reachable. But if you send us a message through Facebook or something, I think we might be able to get messages on uh, Facebook even while we're on, on board the ship. So I have to look at that and see. But uh, anyways, uh, if we... If we can or whether we can be reached or be in touch that way, you guys will be on our, on our thoughts through the week. And uh, uh, we are going to play it safe. Normally when you go on a cruise ship, part of the main feature is get off the boat and go see what there is to see on land. And if it's U.S. territory, we're supposed to go to Puerto Rico, I, I feel, I mean, that'll be just like being at home. I mean, it'll be, uh, it, it's United States territory. But we're gonna we're gonna play it safe, and you know there's some places that ships is supposed to go that's not in the United States. It's in other countries, and we're debating you know even just not getting off the boat at all, we're just staying on board, doing things a little bit different in that regard. Uh, we're supposed to be wearing masks while we're on the ship, um, and uh, it's gonna be safe. So um, so I uh, I feel really good about that. But we're you know when there's choices that we have. We're going to make safe choices. <coughs> um, there was this one place that we were going to go where, like, you could get off the boat and go on a, on a little sailing ship and uh, snorkel down. And but I got to looking at that, and there's just this little tiny boat, and all the people that would be on there would be shoulder to shoulder. You're with people in another country, and I was like, you know, that sounds like fun, but that don't sound like a safe choice. Mm -hmm. So we're going to make safe choices. I, I hope to have to do that later, maybe sometime if the Lord allows us to. But anyways, um, we, we're going to have you guys in mind. We're going to do Jesus' work. Watch out for you guys even while we're uh, a thousand miles away, whatever. But we love you, and, uh, and I appreciate all of you. Again, anybody got anything they'd like to say before we go? All right, well, let's close this in prayer. Uh, when, we, when we do prayers in the future, um, like when we take prayer requests and, and we're calling on, Doug, when you call on somebody to pray for, actually, I'd like to start in, including DJ in on that because you all know about his um, assignment with the uh, ROTC? They actually, um, they actually designated him to be... Uh, in training to be a chaplain, and so did say something about that. Yeah. So uh, we're going to have our first sermon in this series is going to be on prayer, and uh, uh, um, and then after that I'm going to start adding him onto the list to pray for and, and, and let me know if there's you have any concerns about that. That's I think that's God's doing His work again. So I want to encourage him. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come to you right now. We love you and praise you again. Thank you. Lord, you have a work that you're wanting to do here. And Lord, I Lord, I lay myself and my wife out to submit to you and to the work that you're wanting to do. Show us where we need to do things better, where we need to apply ourselves more, where we need to give more of ourselves. Father, I pray for each person in this church and thank you for them. Lord, we pray for the house while they are uh, out traveling. Keep them safe and bring them back uh, to us um, all one peace and good spirits. Uh, Father, again, for all the prayer requests that have been made, we love you and thank you and put our trust in basically that you're going to act speedily on all of those. Father, we love you and praise you in Jesus' name.